welcome you to the New York City launch of the Israel Baseball League and the official player draft. My name is Emily Posner, and this is my co-organizer. My name is Alicia Post, and we are so excited to be co-organizing this very special event. We have here a panel led by WNBC's Len Berman and an array of very important people from the league. The official player draft will begin. We have the draft officials seated over here, led by Martin Berger. Jeremy Schaap will officiate. Hello, everyone over there. It's going to be a big night for the league. Last June, Emily and I had the opportunity to attend a unique Israel advocacy training event for Tugli Birthright Israel alumni. Tonight, the program organized by the Birthright Israel Foundation and the David Project Center for Jewish Leadership, sponsored by the Klarman Family Foundation, provided us with the training necessary to shed positive light on Israel and advocate on Israel's behalf in our communities. One of the benefits of attending this program is we had the opportunity to partner with other program participants and propose our own Israel advocacy event and apply for grant money through the Birthright Israel Foundation and the David Project. Emily and I were awarded this grant in order to promote Israel through something young adults in New York City can really relate to, baseball. We are all so glad that you're here sharing in this exciting event with us, and thank you for coming. Um, now please join me welcoming the moderator of our panel, Mr. Len Berman from WNBC. Enjoy. Thank you. When they, uh, when they called me, I had to say yes because my daughter went to Cornell. They didn't know that when they asked me, but uh, she uh, graduated 2004. She couldn't make it here tonight because she's getting ready for Slope Day in nine days. <laughs> for those who are not from Cornell, Slope Day is where they all drink and listen to music all day. So. Anyway, uh, the format for this uh, panel discussion, there are some uh, distinguished gentlemen to uh, my right. I will introduce them, uh, ask them all to speak. We'll, we'll proceed to discuss what this league is all about. Um, all the punchlines are ready. I mean, Jewish sports stars. I mean, we're ready to go. Um, and, uh, and we'll leave a, a good portion of time for any questions that you may have. And I'm told there may even be a microphone to be able to pick you up or just stand up and shout them out. Anyway, so let me tell you who's here and what their involvement and the connection is with uh, the Israel Baseball League. Starting with the gentleman to my right is Larry Barris. Larry's. resume is, is a Boston businessman and he founded the Israel Baseball League. So he is the man. <coughs> Sitting next to him is one of the premier public relations men in the, in the history of uh, sports in this city. His name is Marty Appel. <laughs> His career dates back to working with Mickey Mantle back in 1968. So he uh, started with the best and he's uh, been with the best ever since. Uh, next up, uh, Next to him is Art Shamsky. I'm sure you know Art. <laughs> Art's the one who will beat you up when you make fun of Jewish athletes because he was a member of the Miracle Mets in 1958. <laughs> Next to him is one of the players uh, who will be drafted here tonight. His name is Nate Fish. Nate is from Cleveland, and he played at the University of Cincinnati, and is currently studying creative writing at the New School. Next to, go ahead. <laughs> Next to him is Dan Rutenberg. <laughs> Dan obviously comes with his own fan club. <laughs> he is a left-handed hitting outfielder, first baseman, who played at Binghamton University for four seasons. And he was named the Jewish All-American. So there you go. Dan Rudenberg. We have Doug Green, a native Bostonian. He helped start Yeshiva University's baseball program, is currently a graduate student of psychology at Columbia University. And last but not least, we have Mr. Brett Rapkin, who is a uh, a director, a producer, an editor. He's going to be, I, I guess the title would be the official videographer of the IBL. Would that be fair to say? Or you have a better title for me? Among other things. Among other things. All right. <laughs> right. 
One of his projects was called Spaceman, a baseball odyssey, which is an independent film about former Red Sox lefty Bill Spaceman Lee, which was obviously uh, shot primarily in Cuba. <laughs> so that's our panel, and uh, there you go. If you know anything about Bill Lee, that would be the perfect place to uh, take him to quirky left-hander. Anyway, let me start with Marty Appel. For those of you who are, want to know what the IBL is, and uh, you know, he's the public relations man, so let Marty give you a little snapshot of what this is all about. Thank you, Len. Uh, when, we first, when we had our first IBL story on Channel 4, and Len did a report on it, Sue Simmons made a little crack about Jewish athletes, and you were quick to their defense. You did a great job that evening. Well, I said the Mets currently have three on the roster. Right. So, I mean, that's pretty good. I mean, uh, in fact, there are more Jewish players in the major leagues at this time than there have ever been at a single time. So this is a golden era for Jewish athletes. This is one of the most exciting things I've ever been involved with. And, you know, I worked for George Steinbrenner for many years, and every day was exciting there, as you can imagine. Uh, this has been just thrilling from the first day I got involved with it. Here we go in rapid order. This league is coming together. It is going to be the first professional baseball league in the entire <coughs> Middle East. It is the kind of thing that brings a smile to your face as soon as you say it because it's two feel-good things, Israel and baseball. Uh, it's the conception of Larry Barris, who you'll hear from in a few moments, but I call him Abner Doubleday now because he brought this forth for us. Um, it all starts June 24th. There'll be six teams with 20 players each. They'll play 45 game schedules. They'll share three different fields. They'll be game pretty much every day of the week, except as you would expect, Friday nights and throughout the Sabbath. And it'll culminate in a championship to be played between the first and second place teams in the league. <coughs> Dan Duquette has been our director of baseball operations. As you all know, he was the general manager of the Boston Red Sox and the Montreal Expos, and his expertise has, uh, has been a godsend for this league, particularly with the speed with which we've had to come to this point today with the draft. With the player draft today, I'm reminded when uh, the Mets drafted their original team for the 1962 season, and their first pick was a catcher named Hobie Landreth. And the sports writers asked Casey Stengel, why did you pick Hobie Landreth first? And Casey said, you got to have a catcher or you're going to have all pass balls. <laughs> <laughs> if we have a catcher drafted in the early rounds tonight, we'll know that's kind of one of the reasons, and Casey Stengel will be the spirit of that. That's it, Len. Well, just uh, uh, run down a couple of the rules, or do you want Larry to do that? Um, yeah, I'll do that. Yeah, just, I just want the fans to know okay. that it's not the exact same rules that they're well, used to a baseball. We reckon Israelis love soccer <coughs> and love basketball, so we know they're sports fans. But we've got to win them over to appreciate baseball. And we kind of grow up with it here. And, you know, especially American Jews have always loved the trivia and the statistics and the, the rules and lore of the game. Uh, the literature of the game. This is kind of a rapid force feeding. We're asking a whole nation to kind of learn a game, even as adults, that they haven't grown up with. So as part of the recognition that we've got to make this entertaining for them, the games will proceed at a fairly rapid clip, I think. I'd be surprised if they were over two hours. The games will be seven innings. If there's a tie, it's going to be decided by what we know as a home run derby here, which is a very unique Thing. Maybe Major League Baseball will like it so much they'll adopt it here. You never know. Um, and uh, we're going, you know, we want to ultimately succeed by making the Israeli people embrace this game. And uh, as such, we want them to sample it and we want to see the game played with a certain proficiency that they're seeing good baseball played. As such, these tryouts that Dan Duquette and Martin Berger have conducted. Uh, have brought forth some really good talent, and the emphasis has been on signing good talent so that we showcase baseball as a really high-skilled game. Do they all make the same amount of money each player? Is that the plan? That's a Larry question. That's a Larry question. <laughs> all right, so... Uh, and if I might just add one thing to the question you posed to, to Marty. Uh, there was one other rule that we contemplated, this being Israel, with a right, right to left, we were thinking of having the players run from third base to first base. <laughs> <laughs> I told you, no shortage of punchlines. 
And, uh, and they're not going to play on Shabbos or Tisha B'Av, correct? <laughs> Actually, again, we, have, uh, we had a schedule glitch, and we needed to have a game air of Tisha B'Av, uh, because one te two teams have to play in order to catch up. So in the afternoon before Tisha B'Av, we have a game called a fast game. And it's a game that everybody's moving fast, everything takes place, the players have to run out to their positions, run back, and so on. And that game will be three and a half minutes. So uh, here's the founder, and then the question, of course, will begin, and then he can explain why he got into this, but why a guy in the bakery business in Boston, Massachusetts, decides he's going to create the Israel Baseball League. So take it away, Larry. Okay, thank you. Um, this actually goes back to the summer of 2005. And... Uh, I was just looking for a small project to do for baseball, I, for, for Israel rather. I, I, I'm not one that really goes for committees, uh, I don't like serving on boards, so I was looking for just something I could undertake that was relatively manageable. Um, I went to a, uh, a minor league game in Brockton, Massachusetts on a Saturday night. I was there because my son happens to, happened to have worked for the Brockton Rocks. And uh, Brockton is a tough town, you, you see people with tattoos and, and and every orifice has something pierced. And uh, I went there and uh, what I saw were thousands of people enjoying themselves just immensely. And it wasn't just your typical baseball fan, it was the grandparents and the parents and their teenagers and their little kids and they all came together on a Saturday night and, and, and you see these teenagers wearing the balloon hats and, and their faces painted. And it just seemed to me to be just so wholesome and so much fun. Everybody was really having a grand time. They were dancing with each other in between the innings, uh, the entertainment in these games uh, in between every inning. And it just seemed to me that this picture, if this is something that could be transported over to Israel, what a gift that would be. And I think from that night on, it's been 24-7 trying to work on this to make it happen, and it looks like it's going to happen. How does one go about forming a baseball league out of the blue? Uh, actually, the first call I made was to a gentleman sitting over there, uh, Martin Abramowitz, who is the guardian, the, the caretaker, I think that's what you call it, of, of, of Jewish baseball memories. Uh, I hadn't met uh, Martin other in passing, than in passing one day, and I knew nobody, I knew nothing about baseball in Israel at all. The trajectory of my learning curve, I knew would have to go straight up. And I called Martin because he came out with a, a series of Jewish baseball cards. So he was the only person I knew of that might know something. So I called him up and he agreed to meet me for coffee and I told him what I was thinking. And Martin's a very nice man, so he didn't laugh and, and he, he gave me you know, the time. I did have to pay for the coffee. Uh, and he gave me the name and phone number of a fellow in Israel. He said, this is somebody that knows about baseball in Israel. And, uh, from then, I made a list, and I, you know, the, my walls still have those lists. I have 17 different posters on the wall with to-do lists, and my to-do list starts off with a certain number, and then at the end of the day, it's got a bigger number. So you tend not to ever get, like you feel, uh, feel like you accomplished anything, but here we are, 58 days, 22 hours, 11 minutes, three seconds, and <laughs> we're ready to go. Marty, do you have a list of all the teams, the names? You have the Modine Miracle, that's one. Do you have the other teams and maybe mention some of the other managers that the, that the fans have heard of? Yeah, let me, so I don't get the managers wrong. Art will manage the Modine Miracle, and uh, it's easy to remember Miracle Mets and Modine Miracle. Ron Bloomberg, the first designated hitter in baseball history, you remember him from the Yankees, uh, will manage Beth Shemesh. Ken Holtzman, who pitched for the Cubs, the Oakland A's, and the Yankees, uh, will manage Petak Tikva, which is a sister city of Chicago, so there's logic to that match. Steve Hertz will man manage the Tel Aviv Lightning. Now, Steve had what's called a cup of coffee with the Houston Astros, pitched very briefly for them. But he's been a very successful uh, manager at junior college in Miami, Miami-Dade. Uh, a very successful and prominent figure in Australian baseball named Sean Smith will manage Netanya, the Tigers. And the sixth manager has, is yet to be named. It may be an Israeli. They're still looking at different candidates. Oh, <laughs> and he'll manage Renata. He managed it to be named later. Yep. 
So Art uh, decides that he's going to be a manager. So take it away and your thoughts and what that's all about. Well, it was uh, when Marty contacted me about it. My first thought was that uh, you know I just didn't know if he was serious or not. And the more I thought about it, and then met with Larry and talked to him about it, uh, it became a real, a real interesting thing for me. I, I've been lucky enough to be part of some wonderful things in my life. Of course, the Miracle Mets was a, a great experience, but this was a chance to do something that was a little unusual. Uh, I've never been to Israel. Uh, the common denominator in this whole thing is, is the wonderful sport of baseball. Uh, baseball is an international game now, uh, an opportunity to bring it to a country that, that seems to be in turmoil all the time, and, and uh, a chance to, to develop a game over there, uh, and something that you love, work with young kids. This is only not only about professional baseball, I, I think it's about uh, developing the game in this country that, uh, that does play sports, and basketball is big over there, soccer. But a wonderful opportunity to work with young kids and, and get involved with some of these youngsters over here who might not be so young, but be still younger than me. <laughs> and an opportunity to teach and, and use my experience of having been a Major League Baseball player, professional athlete, and being part of that wonderful Met team. So I look at it as a, a wonderful opportunity to uh, go over there and, and work with some players and, and, and just have a wonderful time and help develop the game over there. And if I can develop it and help develop it in, in some capacity, I think it'd be a wonderful opportunity for me. Baseball is, is a wonderful opportunity. Sports is a great opportunity for everybody. Uh, and and uh, I was lucky enough to play in a, a wonderful era of great players. And for me, it was never a problem about any religious any religious problems at all. So um, I just looked at it as a great opportunity to be part of a, of a wonderful sport. Again, being on that team, uh, still in the art because of it. So for me. This is an opportunity to, to really uh, um, use my experience of having been a professional athlete, a professional baseball player. Hopefully I can help uh, and get this league off the ground. I think it's a great idea by Larry and the people and Dan Duquette and, and uh, Commissioner, uh, uh, the Commissioner Carter and all everybody that uh, is involved in this thing because it's a wonderful, wonderful uh, experience for the country to be part of this and uh, hopefully um, we'll all do our part to make it a, a success. I think it will be. Well, we've got three of the ball players lined up next to Art, and I think you should just start, you know, go down one of, uh, you know, each of you speak about, you know, why uh, you got into this, uh, where you started your sports career, what you're doing now, what you hope to get out of this league, why you started. Um, I first heard about the league. My father called me. He had read an article. I think it was the first article that had been published about the league in the New York Times, and. Uh, I was getting phone calls every day after that from both of my parents talking about the first tryout, when it, when the uh, first tryout was. We decided that I would go to the first tryout. I was completely excited about it right from the first time I heard. I went to the first tryout in Massachusetts. There were 60 guys there that day and 60 more the next. Uh, I recognize this is the first time I've seen several of these guys since then. Um, and a few months later, I uh, got my evaluation in the mail, and a few months after that, I signed the contract. And uh, this is the first time I played at the University of Cincinnati when my four years there were done, and I didn't get drafted. I thought it was the end of my baseball career, and it was, you know, it's, I think for everyone that goes through that, it's a hard time. And this is an amazing chance for me. I've been coaching since, and I've been playing a lot since. Um, but to get to play professional baseball now really is, tonight is my dream come true in many ways. Hey Dan, before you go, I just, we should point out, you don't have to be Jewish to play in the league. Uh, come on, you're the founder. Uh, what, what are the rules about the religion in this league? <laughs> it, it is amazing that you know you can try to make no statement at all about religion, and by making no statement about religion, by definition, you're making a statement about religion as, as far as Israel is concerned. Uh, bottom line is this is supposed to be a league that is open to everybody. It's supposed to provide a level playing field for all concerned, and as a result, this is a, a league that is open to every denomination, every race every gender. We actually tried to find some women players and unfortunately when we found three that were really considered to be potential players to look at, it was during the war last summer and they just opted not to try out. It was just a little too uh, too challenging as far as the, the time period goes. 
So it's open to everybody, and in fact, I think the majority this year will be Jewish, but it's only a slight majority. And uh, from from Israel, from the United States, what's the breakdown of the, of the athletes? We have uh, players now from nine countries, and I always get to eight, and I, I leave off somebody, but it's United States, Canada, and Israel. Then there's the Ukraine, there's Venezuela, the Dominican Republic, Japan, Australia, Belgium, I believe. Uh, that's nice. That's nice. That's nice. That's nice. <laughs> I know you've made it with one of Cuban defects the early days. I guarantee you in Israel, they'll be telling me something about not having a minion because we don't have 10 countries. You know, there's always hey, Can I just ask one question? Is there uh, any rules or regulations about length of hair? I would say that whoever is selecting for the Modine team not select Nate Fish. <laughs> no, I like it. I like it. <laughs> Already. I already gave him a nickname. We worked out yesterday, gave him a nickname. And it is? Peppy. <laughs> that would be for Joe Pepito, the former Yankee, who was the first uh, athlete to bring a hair dryer into a baseball. <laughs> a Brooklyn guy, you know? All right. Dan, your turn. I guess uh, if I'm going to start at the beginning, for me it was a dream to play baseball, period. Um, I grew up and uh, I guess I was a pretty good wiffle ball player in, uh, in camp. And um, I said to my parents, I want to play Little League Baseball. And my dad was born in Israel. He had no idea what baseball was. My mom didn't play sports other than punch ball, which she supposedly was pretty good at. Um, and so I literally waited about three years until they signed me up. So I would have dreams about playing baseball. That was, and I think that's, what, that's where the connection that I have to baseball began because it was really a dream to play. So then I started playing and, you know, uh, things, uh, things progressed from there. But my dad, actually, um, who passed away 16 years today, it's kind of interesting, he came to, uh, he would take me to all my games. And at first, he did not understand why the pitcher was not putting it right over the plate for the hitter because he actually thought they were on the same team. <laughs> And two years later, he learned everything he could and he managed the team. So, uh, you know, we really had a, a real connection um, through baseball. And then, of course, when I read about this Israel Baseball League from the New York Times, I emailed Larry. Larry responded, and I just thought it was an amazing fit because it really combined two passions of mine, baseball and Israel. Uh, and I think it's a very, it, it catches a lot of people's imagination, this combination. And um, I think not only are we bringing baseball to Israel, but we're bringing Israel baseball. And um, it's, a, it's an area of the world that's known uh, in most places for the conflict there. And this is giving Israel a different kind of attention. And uh, I just think it's great. And I'm really, really excited to be part of it. And couldn't be happier. Uh, my wife is doing about in less than a month. So... She's been great, she's been really supportive, and so uh, I'll be going over there, and then the plan is for uh, Shelby to come with the baby and the two mother-in-laws to help out, so I'm ready to go. <laughs> Alright, David, take it away. I started, I um, also uh, grew up playing Little League, but um, it was always kind of against the odds. Like I was, um, I remember my team for three years uh, growing up in the suburb of Boston, was the Yankees, and uh, fate would have it, we'd always face the Red Sox in the Little League Championship of that town, and every single year we lost to them. So I don't know if it was stacking the deck which way, but um, we were almost like bittersweet losses, actually. Uh, but as time went on, I got into high school, and our high school actually didn't have a baseball team at the time. So a lot of guys got together, and we said we want a baseball team, and a little bit of pushing and shoving and kicking. And then our high school ended up having a baseball team, so for the entire time that I was there, I got to play. It was, it was a great experience. And then I get to college, and there's no uh, college baseball team. So uh, we didn't really know what to do, so a couple of guys would always talk about it. Man, I, I just would love to play NCAA ball. And uh, an opportunity sort of fell in our lap, and uh, we ran with it, and we got a chance to, to create a program now um, that's in its, I guess, second or third year up at Yeshiva University, which is... Uh, where we are right now, and um, that was a wonderful experience. 
And that's kind of where I thought the dream would end, because uh, to create your own league, that's like a step that's a little bit further than what I was kind of capable of doing. Um, but uh, like any part of the Jewish world, word gets out very, very fast when something's happening. And, um, and everyone was just talking about it, uh, about the space building, and it just buzzed around. And I remember calling, I don't know if Larry remembers this, but I remember calling one summer day from my office, uh, calling that number that was attached to that, the original website, and saying, um, you know, hi, my name is David Green, I, I've heard about this, I was wondering uh, what's happening, what can be done, what can I do? And, and Larry's response, and I'll always remember, he goes, oh yeah, we've heard a lot about you, it's, it's kind of exciting, we're really looking forward to it. And I thought right then that was the coolest thing I'd ever heard in my life. <laughs> and Larry heard about I me. thought you said you were Sean Green. <laughs> I mean, this is, and again, it's going to get really savvy, but this was, it seems to be, to me, that everyone that I speak to, whether it's on the planning, the organizing, the commissioner side, the, everyone seems to be saying the same thing, this is a dream come true for me. So this is just kind of a lot of people's dreams coming together to build this league, and it's just very exciting. I mean, do you, is there a fantasy here that, hey, this is a first step toward maybe rejuvenating some kind of a baseball career, or is that a stretch? <laughs> 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 Um, I'm 27 years old right now, which is, I'm getting up there a little bit in the baseball world. I'm excited to do this, I'm not really going to, I'm going to dance around that question a little bit. I'm just really excited for the summer, uh, and I just hope to have a good summer and stay healthy and play well. There you go. It's going to be great with the Israeli media. Just wait. <laughs> Don't tell them nothing. I'm 34 and I'm going to the majors. <laughs> Great baseball name, Rutenberg, like root, root, root for Rutenberg. Oh, uh, terrific name. <laughs> Brett, wh why are you involved? And tell us about some of your projects and what you're looking to get out of this situation. Uh, this was something that I read about in the New York Times, like so many other people. And you don't really choose these stories, they choose you. I mean, some things just, just speak to you. And, uh, you know, anytime there's baseball grows to a new country, it's a beautiful thing, and when it's Israel, it's just got so many more layers. So, yeah, I just got in touch with Larry and went to the, the first tryout and hope they didn't kick us out. They didn't, and I uh, met, met Larry and Dan Duquette and some of the other esteemed uh, people that have come on board, and it just went from there. The idea that there's going to be a draft of players that range from age 17 up to 51, that have each and every one of them has a, a particular story, all of them still harbor their dreams. Uh, in, in the first tryout, I went to the airport to pick up somebody that flew in from California, a guy named Willis Pumpus, uh, 21 years old. He came with his grandfather. And uh, they flew all the way in. I drove them out to, to Hinsdale, Mass. It was about a two-hour drive. Got there around midnight. Next morning, 6.30, there's Willis and his grandfather out there on the field. And uh, they play. Uh, at, at about 1.30 in the afternoon, the tryout is done. Uh, Willis asks for a ride. I drive him and his father back to the airport. And they, they go all the way back to San Diego. That was one of the shorter trips. Uh, Adam Crabb showed up the morning of, in, in Hinsdale. Adam is a gangly six foot six right-hander from Australia who had heard about it on the internet. Flew in. Uh, we had players that drove in from Kentucky, played, drove all the way back. Uh, we've got a caliber of player that I think probably even, even surprised Dan Duquette, who I should tell you, uh, I, I, maybe I can't tell you the extent to which his fingerprints are all over this to the positive, that uh, uh, some of us are looking at this league and the players in a very sentimental way. There was a player down in, in, in Miami who showed up. He was very adept around first base. He handled, handled himself well in the batting cage. And he ran the 60-yard dash in 8.2, which for me sounded OK. It wasn't great. <laughs> but he happened to have been 67 years old and a Holocaust survivor. Uh, and so he was there. And then in Hinsdale, a left-handed catcher showed up, who I think was born in 1948, and felt that if he was born in 1948, that probably would give him a leg up and make him a lead. <laughs> Dan has been really adamant that, along with everything else that's going on, we have to really give Israel the best players possible. And he has really set the standard and kept to it. 
And he has gone to every single tryout and ran every single tryout along with Martin Berger. So the, 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 I would say the common denominator among all these players is that they're all really great. And that's thanks to them. We've gotten such great attention for this league and somebody just gave me this evening. This was uh, last Friday's Chicago Tribune and we're on page one with the big feature story. And this has been repeated time and again internationally, um, not just here. When uh, we had a press conference to introduce the managers at the end of February, the story got picked up in China. So uh, it should be pointed out also that you're probably familiar with the fact that Major League Baseball has uh, created a World Baseball Classic, which will be played every three years. And it would be really nice if this evolves into Israel being one of the teams that participates in that classic. This is something we're going to do. Our games are going to be televised every Sunday night on our Roots Sport, which is like the ESPN <coughs> of, uh, of Israel. And uh, the opening game is going to be telecast, telecast on PBS this coming year. And uh, we're also going to have the games on our website. And the reason for all of this broadcasting, all this exposure, is because our sense is that we want to get the American audience to be able to see the caliber of play, see what we're doing. And the more exposure I think we give to our players, the more likely it is that in coming years we'll become that league of choice because the players are going to see that not only are they getting exposed to the American public, but that there are people like Dan Duquette, people on our board like Randy Levine is the president of the Yankees, Bud Selig is the commissioner, uh, people of that ilk that uh, are, are part of the baseball fraternity. And so I, I, there are already links. We've already gotten phone calls and have heard from many of the Jewish owners and my sense is that uh, they're following us already. Guys from all over America I know and all over Israel are going to be coming and playing in this league and there's a chance where everyone who's, I mean, um, either uh, affiliated with Israel or not necessarily affiliated with Israel, I've got friends who are already dogging me about when am I going to see you on TV, when am I going to tune in, and then these people that are just now, like, I think Nate was talking, focusing all their eyes for positive right onto Israel and uh, it's a great opportunity. Try to get uh, as much content as possible on the website uh, so that people can follow here in the States. Um, this PBS broadcast that uh, uh, the IBL has been able to put together is going to be tremendous. There's already six cities that have uh, agreed to run it on their PBS affiliate, starting with, it started with uh, 13 here in New York and it's, it's growing quickly. Uh, but that's going to be a great introduction into the league and, and hopefully there's all kinds of content so that the website really becomes a, a destination for, for people here in, in Israel and, and all over the world. I went to Israel in November for the tryouts. Uh, there was a lot of media there. There were a lot of media there, especially Israeli media, including the Hebrew language Israeli media. And I was interviewed by a young woman reporter who worked for one of the local Hebrew language stations. And she asked me two questions. She, she asked me, why are you bringing baseball to Israel? And then she asked me, do you think you could make money at it? And I gave her the answer to the first question. I thought I gave her you know, good reasons why this is good for Israel and why we're doing this. And then I gave her the answer to the second reason, the second question, that yes, I do think we can make money at it, that uh, there's merchandise sales and ticket sales and an economic model that I thought could make some sense. The people that watched it that night told me the next day that it was edited somewhat. And it was edited in the forum that the question was posed uh, so why are you bringing baseball to Israel? But the answer that they gave was, well, I think I can make money at it. <laughs> so I think the first reaction was borderline antagonism, actually, that this could be another one of those cases where the Americans are trying to force their culture upon the Israelis. There's a real love-hate relationship, I think, with everything American. Some things they love, some things they hate. And, uh, I have found that since that last November, they have moved from that borderline antagonism into a grudging embracing of what we're trying to do. There is a buzz over there that I have seen in subsequent trips that certainly were, was not there when I first went. So I think over time, I think they're going to learn that this is actually something to enjoy, something really that will have a lot of societal benefits. Nice to see the Israeli media is about the same as our media, <laughs> how they handle things. Um, we have a bunch of questions over here. Tell, uh, just tell us a quick thing about the stadiums before we take the next question. Oh, was that your question? Yeah. Go ahead. You, you ask the question. You'll ask it much better than I would. Tell us about the stadiums we're doing. <laughs> <laughs> so 
why my finger on the pulse of this <laughs> the, the, uh, We're playing six teams out of three venues. And all three venues are pretty much only in Israel type of venues. Uh, first venue is in Kibbutz Gezer, which is about 25 miles, a 25-minute 20, ride outside of Jerusalem on the way to, to Tel Aviv. You, you go up this, this winding road off the, off the old highway, and uh, you're climbing up, and you, you go past vineyards and, and past a, a biblical retreat, a park. And you get to a mesa, and you get out of your car, and you look toward your left, and there's a baseball field. And it, it's smack in the middle of, of, of all these agricultural fields. And you get out, and you're sitting there. And this is my first day in Israel, in fact. Uh, I had gotten off the plane. I hadn't even slept. And, and I'm sitting there behind home plate. There's a baseball game going on with, with little Israeli kids. And I'm tired. I'm almost in a stupor. That Somebody gives me this Turkish coffee that immediately you know, <laughs> got me right up there. And I'm watching these, these beautiful little faces. And uh, I'm hearing that one of the kids yelling to the other one is running towards second base. Uh, Amichai, slide. Amichai, slide. And I've never heard something like that. <laughs> Over the left field fence is... A, a mound, it's a tell, and that is where they found the ruins of King Solomon's summer palace. Over the center field fence, you look down there, you see the coastal plains, and you find out that that's where the Maccabees encamped prior to the Hanukkah revolt. So what you have in that field, you're sitting under the shade trees, you have the, the, the sense of the flowers coming down with the, uh, with the breezes off the plains, you're watching these, these players, you're, you're watching this field, it was actually rebuilt by George Toma in 1997. George Toma is the godfather of groundskeepers. Uh, so that's one field. Second field is in Petah Tikva, and it's actually going to be the home of our opening game. It is smack in the middle of what's called the Baptist Village. So only in Israel will you have opening game of baseball in the middle of the Baptist Village. There, if you hit a ball over the right center field fence, you're going to hit it into a chapel. Surrounding the field is uh, a group of bungalows, which is really a retreat for Baptists that go to village, uh, go, go to visit Israel. Uh, the seating is going to be uh, part American, part Israeli. This is summertime, so it's going to be very hot, and everybody in Israel loves barbecues and picnicking, especially during the summertime. So the seats are going to be 60% stadium type of seats and 40% picnic tables and chairs and lounges and places to put your blankets out so they can really relax and have their barbecues. There'll be plenty of barbecues around. The third field is in Tel Aviv. It's in the Sportec, which is the central park of, of Tel Aviv. And uh, it's along the Yarkon River. And it, too, is one of the most amazing uh, scenery uh, vistas that you can see. You see Tel Aviv on all sides. So I think that the branding of, and the experience of baseball in Israel is going to be as much the facilities as it will be anything else. There will be baseball cards. We had to wait until the players were actually uh, joining their teams to find out uh, uh, what teams they'll be so that we have them in the right uniforms, but there will be baseball cards. And virtually everything is going to be done in Hebrew. The, we're going to see how Tikva before the games. Uh, <laughs> Uh, we actually have somebody who has written a version of Yud, Mem, Gimel, Aleph, which is YMCA. In, 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 uh, uh, so, so we'll be singing that. Uh, somebody Not else, YMHA? It should be. Uh, we have a version of Take Me After the Ball Game in Hebrew. And it'll, it'll be bilingual, but there'll be a heavy emphasis upon Hebrew. I think that that's what people really want to see in here. It is, it is the Israel Baseball League. Um, a lot of barbecue stuff. I was asked two questions more than any other when I, went, when I first went to Israel. One was, will you be playing on the Sabbath? And one is, will you have a lot of barbecues? And it was more barbecues than, than the other question. What's with Jews and food? Who will throw out the first ball? Hmm. <laughs> a surprise, yes. Thank you. Um, we don't know for sure. There are several people that uh, are under consideration. I will tell you that Dan Kurtzer asked Condoleezza Rice, uh, who did not say no. She said, let me see my schedule. Uh, Prime Minister Ulmer cannot come because of concern, uh, concerns about security. Um, 
So, th so there are others that we're thinking about. The, what we don't want to do, though, is to overshadow the game itself. We were thinking who should sing Hatikva, for example, and I think at the end of the day, we're looking to have 3,000 people sing Hatikva. I think that actually that's probably going to be a little bit more fitting than finding one celebrity to do it. So, so by and large, I don't think that the celebrities will be what we're going to feature. I think it'll be much more the game itself, the people, and the, the fact that this is the first baseball game in Israel. We realize that there's kind of a larger story to this than the game of baseball itself, but we also keep things in perspective. We don't want to be more things to more people than we can possibly accomplish in year one. We want to provide the Israeli people with a peaceful sense of security at the ballpark, with a pastime that we have embraced here in America for over a century, give them a good family form of entertainment, and just provide that extra little happiness in their life without taking on more of an agenda than we could possibly manage to accomplish. Every year, there's something called the Peace Tournament in Tel Aviv, where the Israel Association of Baseball takes students from two high schools, one Arab high school and one Jewish high school, and brings them out to the field in Sportec. They teach them the rudiments of the game in the morning, and then they have games in the afternoon where the teams are integrated. Uh, again, we're, we're trying to have really one message, and the message is that we're bringing fun uh, to, to, to Israel. Israel has six, seven, uh, 7 million people now, 7.1 million, a million or two of whom are Arabs. And so I think it really behooves us, if you only want to say from an economic point of view, to look at that entire market and not turn our back on it. But we'll do more. We're going to be very proactive in going to the Ethiopian community, the Arab community, uh, really trying to make this thing a sport that is a sport for every man over there. Right. That concludes our little panel discussion. We still have some more events to come. I just want to thank you all for inviting me. I mean, I'm, I don't have a vested interest in all this. It, it sounds fascinating. I'm certainly looking forward to giving it some coverage on television over here. And I just wish you all the best. Thank you.